McCarthy believed he was a leader of a gang involved in stealing millions of pounds in drugs. million pounds was taken when a security van was held up in Fairview during he January. Suspected of involvement in the theft of over three million pounds taken in an armed raid on the Brinks Allied security depot in 1996. One of the Criminal Assets Bureau's first targets was Jerry Hutch. Operation Alpha was the code name for the mission to seek and seize the criminal stash of Jerry Hutch. One senior cop who kept a close eye on the career of Jerry Hutch was Felix McKenna. As head of the Criminal Assets Bureau, he would become the monk's nemesis. I was aware that Jerry Hutch was a, a gang boss from the inner city. He lived a kind of a sober lifestyle. According to the intelligence, he never drank, and he was a non-smoker. He came from a large family in the inner city. Came up through uh, what you would describe as very hard times as a young boy. He left school early in life at about 13 or 14 years of age and got himself involved with a gang of young individuals in the inner city, commonly known and written about in the newspapers at the time as the Bugsy Malones. A handful of mere children have scandalized this country with their lawlessness. They become known, perhaps unfortunately, as the Bugsy Malone gang. Well, what about stolen goods in the area? Well, how do you get rid of them? You, you get a boy all right. He says, a boy to have it, then you go and get it. Then you get it, and then he buys it off you. Have you any trouble finding people in the area to buy stuff off you? No, no trouble at all. Their MO was simple. They'd run into a bank, maybe four or five of them, with guns, leap over the counter, terrify the staff inside, grab whatever money was accessible to them and out the door and disappear. In time, Hutch would build a formidable reputation, but in his teenage years, he'd not been so clever. Reckless and careless, he was jailed a total of 11 times in the 1970s for burglary, joyriding, car theft, larceny and assault. While inside, he taught himself how to read and write and prepared himself for his career in life, crime. Going to Mountjoy for a criminal kid is like getting to third level college. They've no sense of shame in being in jail where most families of whatever class would die of mortification. When I was on Dublin City Council and in my own constituency, I could see the absolute disregard they had for just ordinary, hard-working, working-class families. And I had no sentiment or concern about the niceties of life for these people. They were just baddies as far as I was concerned. Hutch graduated from the Villains University with full honours. He used his liberty to hone his skills as a thief and stay out of the slammer. But the stakes for armed robbery were high. One slip and you could end up dead. A number of his associates, close associates that were involved with him in the gangs, were shot dead during robberies in the inner city by police officers who uh, confronted them during the robberies. He then more or less changed his MO and uh, became very, very secretive in what he did. Jerry Hutch adopted a complete change of attitude. Go on no robbery unless it was well planned. He became one of those masterminds of uh, planning robberies. It took a long time doing the intelligence on, for argument's sake, security vans or security depots. He had a, a cunning criminal brain. As the years progressed, Jerry Hutch himself plus a number of the inner circle worked building up the intelligence and the timing of when deliveries would be made to certain institutions and where vans would be at a particular time. Over the years, Hutch would lose several accomplices to drug overdoses, gangland feuds and forceful Garda action. But three men have been at his side for most of his criminal career. This trusted inner circle includes William Scully, an old Bugsy Malone who was game for anything. Paul Boyle, another risk taker who prospered under Hutch and specialised as a bike man. And Geoffrey Ennis, an ace car thief and a speedy getaway driver. All of these men were classified by Garda intelligence as armed, 
dangerous criminals. Jeffrey Ennis specialized in stealing cigarettes from around the docks. Jerry Hutch, through his association then with the street dealers, and through some close criminal associates of his, the likes of Noel Duggan, known as Mr. King Size, they were able to dispose of any stolen cigarettes on the open streets. As the years progressed, Jerry Hutch himself became a very complex character. He trusted very, very few people. That was his MO. The less people who know your business, the safer you are. He was assisted by other masterminds who were very skilled at hiding monies and were in a position to advise him. Matt Kelly was a veteran Dublin criminal who specialized in racketeering and money laundering operations. Jerry Hutch had run errands for him when he was a young courier and looked up to Kelly. Now the kid was the talk of the town and needed his own mentor to do him a favor. Kelly, in turn, was in cahoots with an armed robber turned property developer called Paddy Shanahan. Shanahan laundered money through a variety of commercial fronts and dodgy businessmen. But he was an unusual figure. From a respectable background and with a university education, Shanahan got involved in crime for the fun of it. In January of 1987, a Securi Corps van transporting a large amount of cash across Dublin was ambushed in Merino on the city's north side by a group of armed and masked men. They forced the security men out of the van, drove the van to Griffith Avenue, where they emptied it of its contents. The contents amounted to almost £1.5 million. Pounds. This was the largest cash robbery that had ever taken place in Ireland. Therefore, the criminal gang responsible were now gone into a super league of uh, crime bosses. A file was sent to the DPP, but because Jerry Hutch was not directly identified by the two persons who had uh, handled the monies on his behalf, the DPP's hands were tied. There was no evidence to uh, bring a successful prosecution against him. This was the heyday of the thieves' paradise. Dangerous gangsters like the Monk were able to exploit a legal system tilted in favor of organized crime. In terms of armed robberies, if the Gardaí were not successful in apprehending the robbers after the armed robbery and seizing the cash, it was very difficult afterwards to seize the cash if you couldn't identify it as coming from that particular place. Similarly, with property and investments they made as well, that we were, our hands were tied in that particular regard. And you had the ridiculous situation at times when you had these people who, uh, from whom we had seized money, large sums of money, going back into the courts afterwards, all of us knowing where the money came from, and under a police property application, getting the money restored to them by order of the court. Security Corps bought an action to have those monies declared not to be the legitimate property of Jerry Hutch, but to belong to the Security Corps. And we know that Jerry Hutch participated in that uh, case and that he gave evidence. He issued a statement to the court that Lonan Hickey was working as his representative when he lodged the monies and opened the bank accounts in Newry. And he laid claim to the monies that were there. There was no explanation given in Belfast as to the source of the monies. The judge, uh, after hearing all the evidence, adjudicated that on the question of probabilities that the monies in the bank accounts were the proceeds of the robbery in Marino, and therefore Jerry Hutch was not entitled to have them returned to him. Security Corps recovered the monies, and Jerry Hutch and his legal team were ordered to pay all legal costs of the case. And there's an interesting anecdote as well, that Jerry Hutch actually appealed this to the House of Lords, but didn't proceed with the appeal. But in the course of giving the evidence, I'm sure with 2020 hindsight, he would have let the money go. But at the time, um, he decided to follow it. The audacious ploy to pull the wool over the law lords also failed. He even contemplated bringing his case before the European court. However, Hutch's instincts told him that it was better to walk away empty-handed. In the end, he would pay for his cheek. He left behind a paper trail that would one day lead to a more costly reversal of fortune.
Dublin was a dying town in the 1980s. Decay and dereliction disfigured its streets. In this dismal era of a depressed economy and mass emigration, some spotted opportunities. A desperate government brought in tax incentives to foster inner city renewal. The monk still had a lot of cash to dispose of. And in this grim climate, he was the wrong man in the right place at the right time. Paddy Shanahan and Matty Kelly were gangsters with a flair for business and an eye for a deal. They acted as front men for Hutch in a number of property ventures, which gave a steady stream of legitimate income. Matty Kelly was the most interesting man. He had an amazing powers of recollection and perception. And of course, he made very substantial good investments. Part of the difficulty surrounding Matty Kelly was for all of the material times that he had assembled this great wealth, he was an undischarged bankrupt. Matt Kelly was unable to officially own property because he was a bankrupt. There was a large amount of money to be infiltrated into a building. Patrick Shanahan and his companies were the way to go. Hutch, Kelly and Shanahan formed a corrupt syndicate. The monk came up with the dirty money, Kelly came up with the dubious property, and Shanahan provided cover for the entire enterprise. In the top end of Buckingham Street, there was a site which Jerry Hutch had identified, and with the assistance and with the scheming of Patrick Shanahan and Matt Kelly, this site was purchased. A building company was formed, and Patrick Shannon took on the responsibility of developing the site. They built a number of apartments there. This was ideal for Jerry Hutch to conceal his money. He was able to pour cash monies into this development and get it up and running. Other senior crime figures also got in on the scam. George Mitchell, the penguin, was just one of many who put his name down for a piece of the action. Now, it was a bitter irony that the gangsters from the ghettos were to be the first to invest in the inner city before the property boom. 100 new apartments went up and provided a grotty haven for asylum seekers. Hutch and company were landlords, with tenants whose rent was paid every week by the Eastern Health Board. Now the state was effectively washing the monk's dirty money and paying top dollar for the privilege. No wonder he had plenty to smile about. Two months after the murder of the general, Martin Cahill, someone with a grievance also shot Paddy Shanahan. Another corporate gangland dispute solved from the barrel of a gun. Gardy still believed Shanahan's murder was organized by a gangster who had also been using his business to launder dirty money. Now, the murder greatly upset Hutch. Apart from being a good friend, Shannon had been an invaluable ally to him. Post the murder of Patrick Shannon, Jerry Hutch was faced with the dilemma of how was he going to identify to the Shanahan estate that he was owed a large amount of monies. A year before his murder, Paddy Shanahan fronted the construction of an upmarket apartment complex in Stephen Street in Dublin. Hutch had secretly invested in the project at Drury Hall and faced losing it all now that his buddy was dead. He stood to lose 180,000, which he had passed to Patrick Shannon's companies to start the development. I would say that Jerry Hutch walked away from that money and forgot about it because it would have unearthed maybe stones that he did not want unearthed at all. Well, I was only in the ministry about three weeks uh, when in January of 1995, the Brinks Allied robbery took place. And that was about three, over three million euros, which now seems a tiny amount of money, but it was a very big robbery at that time. And it meant that from the word go, I was kind of on the back foot. Within seconds, three to four masked men with firearms, guns blazing, entered and stole a large amount of monies. The jeeps that were used to ram the, the centre were abandoned. Two other jeeps were loaded with cash. When they left, they had 3.6 million euro. But everyone wanted to know who was responsible for this mega heist. 
The police knew the Kulak job bore all the hallmarks of Jerry Hutch, but no one was ever charged or convicted for this raid. To this day, not a penny has been recovered. At the time, the Sunday world put a face on the mastermind, and as a result, Veronica Gearn was given an interview with the man himself. He denied he was responsible, but wished the robbers the very best of luck. When Veronica asked Hutch where he got his money from, he ended the interview on a memorable note. He said, it's none of your business. My philosophy in life is simple. No betrayal, you don't talk about others, you don't grass, and you never let people down. A year later, Jerry Hutch queued with hundreds of ordinary, decent citizens to sign the book of condolence for Veronica Gearn. Standing in line, he must have sensed a palpable change in public mood. He knew then that her killers had overplayed their hand. The murder of Veronica would lead to the creation of the Criminal Assets Bureau and turn Jerry Hutch's world upside down. I knew that we had a serious problem out there in what was euphemistically called ordinary decent crime. The Al Capone example would be thrown up. Over 10 years, I heard people talking about why can't we get these people like Al Capone was got for not paying his taxes. Everybody realised that to follow up an organised crime, you've got to follow the money. You've got to get that and where it really hurts. And hence, the urgency to create a bureau or an agency or a unit that would chase the money, the acquisition of wealth of these people involved in this type of crime. That is where the Criminal Assets Bureau came from and why we were able to do it then, because the people understood that things had to be done. We were bringing in something that would hopefully save lives, save people from being the victims of criminal activity. From the beginning, one Gerard Hutch alias the Monk, will be one of the primary targets of a dedicated team of investigators. Jerry Hutch was not going to be a pushover for the dedicated cab team set up to trace his dirty money. The monk lived up to his nickname and kept a low profile and displays of wealth to a minimum. There were major aspects of difficulty in, in, in relation to Jerry Hurt. He lived a frugal lifestyle and there was no possibility of mounting any action based on his general activity. And secondly, the money that was stolen in the two big robberies totally disappeared. There was no clue as to how it got away. And thirdly, there was no evidence on the standard of proof required for a criminal prosecution or even proceeds of crime action of the involvement of Sherry Hutch and others in the suspected robberies. He lived in the cul-de-sac in, in Clontarf, a small development of houses. He purchased it with substantial amounts of cash and assisted by a mortgage. I'm not aware that he ever held down a legitimate job. When asked about the source of his income, he would refuse to answer those type of questions. There's Jerry Hutch's house there. He was and is the quintessential criminal mastermind. If you were ever looking for a quintessential gangster, he's cool, he's quiet, he's clean cut, he's big into family, he lives a sort of a respectable leafy suburb while at the same time maintaining his links with organised crime. Let's not be praising him as a Robin Hood. Over the years, Jerry Hutch had cleverly and secretly acquired a substantial property portfolio. Besides his apartments in Dublin, he also owned property in Spain and Portugal. The beneficial ownership of these homes was hidden behind a complex wall of false documents and front companies. In many instances, the, the fruits of the criminal activities found their way into properties. Property, of course, as you know, is a visible asset, uh, and it's a question of tracking down then the ownership. And there were, of course, difficulties, obviously, in tracking ownership because not everybody puts the, the property they own in their own names. But I think in the way cab worked, they were able to track down a lot of these properties that were in the names of people um, that had become targets.
Unlike most crime bosses, Jerry Hutch had an apparently plausible explanation for his income. While a prisoner in Mount Joy in the 1980s, the unfortunate villain had slipped and hurt himself. As a result, the Department of Justice had coughed up £25,000 in compensation. On another occasion, he received £8,000 as a result of a collision with, of all things, a Securicorps van. And he even collected a handy few bob in libel damages when a newspaper dared to call him a robber. When Cab came calling, Hutch claimed that his properties in Buckingham Street were perfectly legitimate, the result of investing his good fortune in his old neighbourhood. We collected up all of the old investigation files that were available throughout the city, historical tax files on Jerry Hutch. We were able to create a profile of him, his property portfolio, and also a profile of professional people who assisted him in the conveyance of property, etc. Every lead you got, generated another lead or two leads or three leads so the thing proliferated into a large number of separate cases it was a, a labyrinth of cooperation between persons engaged in criminal activity in Dublin we did a huge amount of trawling of bank accounts in Ireland north of Ireland Isle of Man Jersey Portugal Spain and uh, America one line of inquiry led to the accounts held by Hutch and Newry and the records of the High Court testimony given by him in his legal quest to get back the hot money from the Marino Mart robbery. In the transcript of the case, uh, there was 300 and odd thousand pounds in the account and Jerry Hutch gave evidence that he was the legitimate owner. Now, if you strip out everything else, there you have the sworn testimony of a person that he has accumulated 300 and odd thousand pounds from business activity and that makes him liable to tax. In June 1997, a registered letter arrived in the monk's home in Clontarf. When it was opened, the crime boss discovered that he had been assessed for tax to the tune of £500,000. That bill would continue to rise as interest and further tax assessments were made. Eventually, the cab would come looking for over £2 million. This was new ground for these guys. They operated on the old traditional common law system. If they were accused of anything, their answer was prove it. The tax laws are the same tax laws as for any citizen. It's not up to the taxman to prove anything. It's up to you since 1988 to make a full and frank disclosure of all your income and profits and to pay tax on it. And if you don't do that, uh, then the tax legislation kicks in. That assessment will stand, except unless the other person appeals the assessment and can demonstrate that the assessment is uh, inaccurate in, in, in some way. So the also proof moves toward the taxpayer at that point in time to try to demonstrate that, I, uh, no, I didn't generate this kind of income. That places another difficulty, I suppose, in the way of, of the criminal. The people who dealt with the Bureau had great difficulty in coming to terms with that. They regarded it as a colossal injustice that everything didn't have to be proved to a standard beyond reasonable doubt as they would expect it in a criminal case. Barry Galvin, the Bureau's legal officer, had by this time gained himself a reputation as a ferocious negotiator. Criminals who had ignored their payment deadlines had found it a costly infraction. Galvin's response was to raise the levy and hit anyone who reneged on a deal with a hefty penalty. Throughout all of the cases, Jerry Hutch was protesting about the inequality of the process, that he was a poor man with no money, no ability to fund lawyers, etc. And in fact, at one stage, attempted to apply for free legal aid and it made a very strong effort to get free legal aid, 
without subjecting himself to any tests or having to furnish evidence of his assets to the court, and of course he failed. He then sacked his lawyers at another stage on the basis he couldn't pay them, which was a complete joke, of course, to the forces of law and order. Jerry Hutch's initial reaction was to instruct his solicitors and his accountants to contest the tax assessments. This he did during the years of uh, 1997, 1998, and 1999. There was a hearing before the appeal commissioners, which he lost, and then there was a hearing before the High Court where he challenged the findings, which he lost. I give evidence in the High Court of the progress of the cab investigation. And the deciding judge on the day ruled totally against Jerry Hutch. He then had nowhere else to turn. The next step for the Criminal Assets Bureau was to start a process of taking possession of his property and selling them forcefully to satisfy the tax debt. The Achilles heel, as far as I was concerned, was when we got judgment and we judgment mortgaged the house in Clontarf where he was living with his wife, and then proceeded to serve him and the wife with proceedings. This would have led then to a, a forced eviction of, of Jerry Hutch from his home and his property. Including this home here? Including this home, to satisfy the tax judgment that was there. So he thought he could fight you, he tried to fight you, and when he got too close to the family, and he decided to settle it. Jerry Hutch was very anxious that no member of his family be brought into the, into the cab investigation, and particularly his wife. He himself had no difficulty in facing this because this was his lifestyle. The leafy cul-de-sac in Clontarf was now a blind alley. Cornered and with the cab meter running, Hutch decided to throw in the towel. But where was he going to get all that money that he said he didn't have in the first place? After four years of sparring and a series of legal bouts that he had lost on each count, Jerry Hutch finally agreed to surrender to the Criminal Assets Bureau. In March 2000, the cool, clean robber agreed to hand over 1.2 million pounds, or in excess of 1.5 million euro in today's money. He had very little choice. It was either pay up or suffer the consequences of being put out on the side of the road, and maybe long term, uh, prosecuted for breaches of revenue laws, and if he was convicted, he may well have been sent to prison. He sat down with his accountants and his advisors, and in the year 2000, he signed up an agreement uh, in my presence, late at night, in the month of June of uh, 2000. He handed over, on that night, a bank draft for 500,000. It wasn't a happy moment for Jerry Hutch, but, I mean, he was coming to terms with an obligation, and the obligation was to produce very substantial sums of money within a, quite a short time, failing which there were going to be very serious consequences for the family home and other properties. He was very passive and very quiet, and I would describe him as being in the whiter shade of pale when he was handed over. It was, uh, it was causing him a lot of grief to have to this term and uh, part with so much money. To end the grief and get cab off his back, Jerry Hutch sold two of his homes in Buckingham Street. The sale brought in 700,000 pounds. Cab weren't too fussy about where he got the balance, but accepted a deal whereby Hutch would go into his bank in Talbot Street and hand over 500,000 pounds in cash with no questions asked. But Felix McKenna was still on his guard for any funny business. We had learned from Martin Cahill, the general, when he purchased his house in Swan Grove. He made a deposit of 20,000 plus in a bank in Ranelagh. And within 30 seconds after him leaving the bank, the bank was robbed. And the raiders were actually searching for the money that he was after depositing. It was not above the likes of Jerry Hutch's uh, capabilities to organize with some of his associates that after he deposits the money in the bank, that they raid the bank and recover the monies that he was after depositing. That was well within his scope and his capabilities. Therefore, 
the necessity for a security operation. With the assistance of a large number of armed detectives who were positioned at vantage points in Talbot Street to ensure that the money would not be stolen or that he himself was not going to be the victim of a crime as he walked into the bank. The monk was obliged to come in with uh, a suitcase full of money and hand it over to the authorities. So Jerry the Monk, as a result of the Criminal Assets Bureau, found himself pretty much uh, like uh, the uh, Russian leader of old, the uh, poacher, had turned the gamekeeper. The very public capitulation of their godfather demoralized the Hutch crime syndicate. One by one, they began to come out of their hiding places with their hands up and their checkbooks open. His hardcore inner circle of criminals, Jeffrey Ennis, Paul Boyle, and William Scully, they were all individually assessed for tax by the Criminal Assets Bureau. It got to the stage where one of them made contact through a solicitor and said that he couldn't handle the heat anymore. He wanted to come and make a settlement now before they actually got to him, which was an amazing example of why there was a genuine turnaround. They now knew that this was coming down the tracks, and they now knew that there was an ever-increasing sum going to be paid if they didn't deal with it, and that there was an inevitability about it, and they addressed it. I'm satisfied that when the likes of Jeffrey Ennis and Paul Boyle and William Scully received their tax assessment, that there was a, a mini-conference held with Jerry Hutch, their advisor. He was aware of how he had been dealt with by the Criminal Assets Bureau much as it hurt him to hand over monies, he advised these criminals to pay up and get on with their lives. Get them off your back. That was their attitude. Operation Alpha was proof of the need for the Criminal Assets Bureau. Here we had a gang of criminals, but they'd evaded justice. There hadn't been enough evidence to put them behind bars. Now the Criminal Assets Bureau came along, and guess what? They had a bonanza. First of all, we had Jerry Hutch, gang leader. Hutch settled with the Criminal Assets Bureau for 1.5 million euro. Then your gang members, William Scully, Jeffrey Ennis, and Paul Boyle. These three between them paid 750,000 euro. Lifelong criminal figure, Matty Kelly. He was also Hutch's mentor. When Matty Kelly was finished with cab. He paid them 7.1 million euro. Well, the conclusion of Matty Kelly was spread out over a very long period of time because of the difficulty in getting his properties to a stage where they could be sold. He had invested very well in, in a number of properties, and in order to fund his settlement, he needed to sell those properties. He's the one individual in Operation Alpha who took up an enormous amount of time and man hours in his defending cab action against him. He had worked for many, many years building a property portfolio, and suddenly he was faced with losing everything. Ultimately, the properties were sold to very good advantage, and the monies were received over a period. Jerry Hutch and his inner circle coughed up 10 million euro as a result of Operation Alpha. But then the Bureau's net began to spread and ensnare a never-widening circle of his associates. Derek Hutch's brother settled for 120,000 euro. Another brother, Eddie, settled for 150,000. Then we had this man, who made probably the single biggest settlement with the Criminal Assets Bureau in the past 11, 12 years. Dublin car parts dealer, Charlie Duffy. He paid 17.1 million euro. Charlie Duffy was a well-known and very successful scrap dealer who operated from Smithfield in the heart of Dublin's north inner city. An old pal of Matty Kelly's, he had turned up in a trawl of financial transactions involving Kelly. The trail led to Jersey, where Felix McKenna and his team discovered the pot of gold, a sterling account in the name of Charles Duffy with 12 million pounds in it. To Cab's surprise, Duffy didn't put up much of a fight and he signed over the lot to get on with his life. 
Operation Alpha was on a roll. I had no concept of the 12 million sterling. That was certainly not appreciated by me until we got into it. The Matt Kellys and the Charlie Duffys of this world, they had no concept that their lawyers' offices were going to be searched or that the banks were going to have to give out information about them. So they freely uh, dealt with solicitors, dealt with accountants and opened bank accounts. Butcher's best friend, Noel Duggan, otherwise known as Mr. King Size, the man who controlled a huge smuggling racket in the city for several years. He and his business partner settled for over two million euro. Noel Duggan operated from Smithfield in Queen Street. The cab investigation established very close links between Noel Duggan and Jerry Hutch in respect of movements of monies. The, the start of the Noel Duggan case, to my memory, was a public complaint that he was doing so much smuggling that he was interfering with the ordinary business of other traders. And as a result of that, uh, an operation was started and which ultimately ended up in a very comprehensive settlement, which again ended up in the Queen Street property being given over to the Bureau and sold, and the proceeds handed over in discharge of his tax liabilities. In December 2002, Noel Duggan handed over the keys of his Queen Street premises to the Criminal Assets Bureau, and he was not at all happy about it. When I interviewed him at the time for the Sunday World, he told me, they've taken everything, and now I haven't even got the price of a packet of smokes. But he was laughing. It nearly fucking killed me handing over those keys. I'm on my second bottle of brandy already. And what of the man whose downfall led to so much grief? Jerry Hutch today runs a celebrity limousine service. He calls it Cab. Carry anybody. In 2006, one Irish magazine's readers voted him one of Ireland's sexiest men. Now, there's no accounting for some people's taste. Over 10 years later, the ripple effect of Operation Alpha is still being felt. Dozens of criminals have been caught, and to date, the Criminal Assets Bureau has taken in excess of 40 million euro from the lot of them. It delivered a message to the Irish underworld. Despite success in evading justice and prosecution, could be faced with losing everything. But for the Bureau, these people might never have suffered any ill effects of their criminal activity or ill-gotten gains. There is now no criminal in Ireland who can enjoy the fruits of his labour in Ireland. So make sure to be back here next Monday. Paul Williams brings us more Dirty Money. Stay with us tonight, though, for an Easter Monday movie. Wesley Snipes takes crime to new heights, if that is possible after seeing Dirty Money. Drop Zone is after.